Welcome to Space News from the Electric Universe, brought to you by the Thunderbolts Project at thunderbolts.info. What is a neutron star? Astronomers tell us that these tiny yet massively dense objects form by gravitational collapse from the remnants of a massive star that has exploded. According to NASA, a neutron star is about 20 kilometers in diameter and has the mass of about 1.4 times that of our Sun. This means that a neutron star is so dense that on Earth, one teaspoonful would weigh a billion tons. The theoretical neutron star was invented to try to explain highly intense bursts of energy from tiny regions of space. But no one has ever seen a neutron star. Scientists infer the object's existence when interpreting energetic emissions in deep space. Indeed, according to a recent paper in the journal Nature, a so-called neutron star has been discovered that defies understanding of accepted physics. In the nearby galaxy M82, scientists have observed ultra-luminous X-ray pulses from what they believe is a binary system between a star and a pulsar, or rotating neutron star. However, this so-called pulsar shines impossibly brightly with the intensity of 10 million suns. In a recent Nature podcast, research fellow Jeanette C. Gladstone said of this discovery, the original theory that put this limit on how bright these things should be is about 100 times fainter than this object. This was observed with NASA's new star. This is a space-based X-ray telescope. Um, that was actually put in place exactly to survey these kinds of ultra-luminous X-ray events. Now, what was observed was a pulsar, thought to be a rotating neutron star that is emitting energies in the ultra-luminous X-ray range. Now, this is a real problem. It has been held that supermassive black holes are required to power X-ray sources at these kinds of energies. This pulsar is about 10 times brighter than any known pulsar. So something is obviously wrong with the current theory, and that's the point that the authors make. The real issue is that mainstream astrophysics has a gravity-dominated view of the universe. Everything is powered by gravity. So when an ultra-luminous X-ray source was observed, the first question is, well, where is the energy coming from to power it? Well, since gravity is the only tool in the toolbox, the idea of an accretion disk was evolved where a supermassive black hole is pulling matter from a companion star. This matter forms a very thin accretion disk around the black hole. The angular momentum of the infalling matter is converted to heat and then superheated gas, this is in the range of millions of Kelvin, emits the high energy x-rays. But let's be clear. The actual images that we get are X-ray point sources. We don't see accretion disks or black holes or black hole binaries. What we see are highly energetic points of X-ray, point sources of X-ray X -ray that flicker and pulse. But do you need exotic super dense masses to get X-rays at these kinds of energies? Well, actually, no. Lightning is a very good example of a natural phenomenon that emits X-rays and actually gamma rays as well at very high energies. And let's look at X-ray machines. X-rays are emitted from X-ray tubes, basically vacuum tube, where a cathode emits electrons, which impact the anode. The X-ray spectrum and the energy depends on what you use for the anode and the kind of accelerating voltage you have for the vacuum tube. I mean, we found this all out in the late 1800s. So you don't really need an exotic supermassive body and superheated gas to get x-rays. And it's, it's a good thing, too, because imagine how big an x-ray machine would have to be if gravity was the only power source that we had with black holes and superheated gas. Astrophysicists are finding all kinds of stars that shouldn't exist, according to standard theory. But even so, there's no hint that the standard models of stars are under any threat. Now we have a report of a pulsating dead star beaming with the energy of about 10 million suns. So one would think it's back to the drawing board. But how badly does a theory have to fail before you wipe the board clean and start again? How can a dead star beam far more energy than 10 million live ones? The reason for calling the star dead 
is that it has been found to pulsate every 1.37 seconds, which characterises a supposed neutron star. And it's assumed that only a very small, rapidly rotating object, acting somehow as a lighthouse, could do that. Or so say astrophysicists who adopt a simple mechanical view of pulsars. But this requires them to stuff more than one and a half times the mass of the Sun into a sphere of only 10 kilometres radius. As usual, when astrophysicists run into difficulties, they call on particle physicists to get them out of it. And as usual, particle physicists use it as an excuse for inventing strange, unseen states of matter, or dark forces. In the case of pulsars, we are told that the atoms are squeezed so intensely in the imagined death throes of a large star that the electrons combine with the protons in the nucleus of each atom to form a neutron star. This is another one of those astrophysical theories that can't be tested in the laboratory, where neutrons only seem to exist stably for more than a few minutes inside an atomic nucleus, in the presence of protons. However, two dinosaurs unnoticed in the astrophysics lab are our total ignorance of the cause of gravity and our unshakable belief that stars are internally powered. Newton wisely admitted he didn't understand gravity, and Einstein merely described it with a non-physical geometry. But a moment's reflection shows that the idea of supercondensed matter in any form is nonsense, because it is asking the force of gravity to overcome the electric force which can be up to 1,000 billion, 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 billion times stronger than gravity. Infrared images show that stars are born non-gravitationally along glowing current filaments. This results in stars with cool cores of heavy elements that cannot initiate thermonuclear fusion. And in the star's gravitational field, the heavy nucleus of each atom will be drawn towards the centre of gravity of the star or planet. That means each atom will become football-shaped, with the inner end positive and outer end negatively charged. These tiny atomic electric dipoles will daisy-chain like magnets and set up a repulsive electric field inside the star, which offsets gravitational compression. So black holes and neutron stars do not exist. So what is the electric universe answered to the discovery of an object that pulsates and shines about 100 times brighter than theory suggests? It has been shown that the complex structure of stellar pulses can be explained by repeated short circuits in the magnetospheric circuit of a normal star. There's no need for a fanciful whirling neutron star. It's simply electrical engineering 101, a relaxation oscillator effect in the star's atmosphere. The ultraluminosity of a star or galactic object can be attributed to two factors. First is a misinterpretation of redshift, which can place the star much farther away than it actually is. If the star is much closer, the calculated energy output may be grossly overestimated. The second is the ability for plasma to store phenomenal amounts of electromagnetic energy in a very tiny volume, known as a plasmoid. Simple application, then, of E equals mc squared shows that a plasmoid can account for the apparent concentration of mass in a small volume. No black holes or neutron stars are necessary. What's more, plasmoids release particles and energy periodically in jets, as shown by active galactic nuclei. That suggests that we are looking down the narrow beam of a stellar plasmoid that is shining in our direction with the equivalent energy of 10 million suns. As long as gravity is held as the only energy source for these cosmological phenomena, then mainstream astrophysicists will continue to run into the type of issues that they found with this pulsar. It actually makes me kind of wonder what mainstream theory would be now if these kinds of X-ray, gamma ray, and radio observations had been available in the late 1800s or around 1900. Available, for example, for people like Faraday or Maxwell or plasma science pioneers like Birkeland. Maybe now pulsars might be modeled as oscillating circuits. And the energy that they pulse and the frequency would depend on the accelerating voltage of the electric field and the other characteristics of the electric circuit. We know that there are electric currents in space carried by Birkeland filaments. These current carrying filaments have been directly observed between the Sun and the Earth, and for example, between Jupiter and Io. We see filaments twisting and extending thousands of light years everywhere we look. More importantly, we see electromagnetic phenomenon 
pulsing and flickering x-rays and gamma rays and plasma glowing and radio, things that are no more exotic than lightning or electrical circuits that we've been building in the lab for the last hundred years or so. For continuous updates on space news from the Electric Universe, stay tuned to thunderbolts.info.